I pray indeed that there would be more of you and less of me. Through Christ I come. Amen. Well, on our most recent vacation, we flew to one of our destinations. And it had been a little while since I had flown for fun, and so I was, I was very, very aware of the experience as we found our seats and settled in. The flight attendants took their positions to give us the safety instructions. Now I looked around and one man was already asleep. Some others were rapidly trying to get in last minute texts and emails. Others looked out the window. Some talked to their seatmate. Even the attendants looked a little bit bored as they went over the safety instructions. And so I went and I pulled out my instruction card that was in the seat pocket in front of me. And I just started looking over the pictures there. I let the pictures work on me a little bit. Imagining losing oxygen pressure in the cabin, of crash on land or sea, of bailing out of this huge, comfortable plane. It was quite unnerving, really. But then I looked around to all the other people in the plane and I realized that I was the only one sitting there with my instruction card <laughs> looking at me. The instructions on this card, which Tim so graciously scanned and put up for you to see, are concise, visual, and slightly <coughs> But they convey the ultimate point that if this bird goes down, you need to know how to get out of it. Or you need to talk to someone who does. Because you know what? When it happens, it'll be too late to read the instructions. <laughs> Now, the card on the outside, it says, be safe, okay? It says, be safe. And I know the statistics are reassuring. If you go to planecrashinfo.com, you'll see that a mere one out of 4.7 million people die in plane crashes. About the same as lightning. <laughs> It's a much greater chance that you'll die in your bathtub, one out of 800,000, or in your car, one out of 17,000. But what if the stats were one to one? What if it wasn't a matter of if the plane goes down, but when the plane goes down? May I suggest that on the outside of the safety instructions, it would not say, be safe. It would say, be ready. <clears throat> Thus, that is our series title. Dear friends, you need to understand today very clearly that we're riding this enormous craft we affectionately call the Earth. Through our friendly skies of the solar system, its cruising speed is about 67,000 miles an hour. It has a spectacular amount of legroom. Every seat has a window. And there are even places you can smoke on this plane, believe it or not. It rides its regular route. It almost seems to be on autopilot because of its precise flight schedule. Did you ever notice it? Sunrise, sunset, spring, summer, fall, winter. 
it just keeps flying. We tend to enjoy the ride, but you need to know that one day this bird is going to go down. The crash will be complete and unavoidable, but there is a way to survive. Your pilot has given us instructions, a detailed account of how to be ready. And they are still with us today. Though many never even remove the instruction card from the seat in front of them, many will avoid even listening to the instructions. Some may sleep through it or talk right through it. But the instructions remain. I believe these instructions are found in the book of Revelation. I want to welcome you to our new series in our year-long trilogy of John's writings. Jesus' beloved disciple, John, who we have learned to know so well since January. We first studied the Gospel of John, then 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, the epistles or the letters he wrote to the church. And now we enter the final book of John's writing. And but not only the final book of John's writing, but the final book of the Bible. This is John's apocalyptic, or in other words, the unveiled vision for the end of the world. Here is a detailed instruction manual for the coming crash. But you may see it, you may say, oh, oh but Todd, come on. 2,000 years have passed. Lots of people have thought the end was coming, and sooner and sooner, but it didn't didn't come. So what's all, what's all the fuss about? May I first say, you are correct. The end did not come. Good observation. But may I also say, the end is nearer now than it ever has been in our history. Amen. Now, this highlights a primary difference in biblical worldview of history. Now, I'm going to try to do a little visual aid here. Don't get, don't get too excited. It's very simple. This is a little picture of what the pagan or the secular world believes human history looks like. It looks like this. Okay? It just keeps it going. Okay? Millions and billions of years have passed. Millions and billions of years to come. We just go round and round. Nobody really knows why. That's the pagan or the secular view of the history of the world. Okay? Now the Christian view is very different. Please note the difference. The Christian view is like this. There is a beginning. Sorry. And there's an end. That's a very different picture than what the world believes. We find the beginning at the front of our Bibles, in what book? Yes. Very good. We covered that. The ark is out back as a testimony to when we covered that. It was October of 2011. If you want to go back on YouTube and check them out, you can see the ark and all of its glory up front. We talked about Mud Man and the Rainbow Rider because there was a definite beginning to our world by the same token. There's an end. Guess where that comes in the Bible? What book? That's right. That's why we're here. I want you to hold that in your mind because that's something that's very foreign to our pagan world. But most importantly, though, the end of time for our world indeed may not come in your lifetime. Still, the end of our lifetime is coming. 
with shocking effect at a time we don't know. You see, regardless of what your view of the end times is, reality is that your time will end. And this should make you consider what your instructions may be for that coming crash and how you can survive it. So before we dive in, just a couple credits. First, I want to say thank you to all them people who, whenever I do my sermon surveys, every hundred sermons, I give you a survey. And some of you people wrote, would you please do a, a series on Revelation? Would you please do a series on Revelation? You're the reason I'm doing it, okay? Okay, I'm, I'm trying to give you uh, what you want, even though it scares me sometimes. Second credit goes to all those who did the R90, our, our 90 day intensive uh, the other year or so. We had an incredible time going through the book of Revelation together for 90 days, and it helped me prepare so much for this. Thirdly, I want to give credit to Ray Stedman's book, God's Final Word. Now, this was the first book of many books that I read on Revelation that actually made a lot of sense to me. His verse by verse approach to the text was refreshing. Now, do I agree with everything Ray Stedman wrote? No. But do I deeply appreciate his perspective? Yes, I do. And I do recommend the book if you want to uh, read a book that I found very informative and helpful. I hope as God opens this fantastic book to us, His Holy Spirit will give us a solid understanding that we can truly be ready for whatever is next. Now the last credit, on your bulletin, there's a beautiful image. It's Ron Nisiani painting called The Second Coming. Uh, I, I do thank Tapestry Productions, Ron Nisiani's company, for giving us permission to use that image. You will see that image throughout our series. Now, with all that said, if it's okay, we're going to get to the sermon now. Okay, so turn to your neighbor and say, okay, he's done with the introduction. He's done. So turn to your Bibles and open to the very way back of the book, right before that book called Maps. Is in your Bible? Okay, Revelation. Revelation. In your student Bible, it's on page 1349. If you don't have a Bible, you can uh, read and understand that you call your very own. We have them uh, posted on the ends of your pews. If you want a Bible, grab it. Use it today. If you don't have a Bible, take it home. We, we've smuggled out almost 100 Bibles into Smithville. I know you, you like smuggling Bibles in China. I like smuggling Bibles into Smithville. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, grab it. Take it. Uh, we love it when people can have God's Word. Page 1349 in your student Bible, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start reading verses 1 through 3 in Revelation chapter 1. I still heard pages turn, and some of you were like me. Man, I, I never even opened to that book. It's scary. It's okay, don't be afraid. We're in Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Here we go. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it, and take to heart what is written, because the time is near. In this fascinating book, there is a blessing in store. There is a blessing in store. And I would simply ask, are you open to the blessings that are in here to come? Now, I don't want to get you too excited, but just look at the route this book took to get you. Look at the route, because it's unique to any book in the entire Bible. It came from God Almighty. He told Jesus. Jesus told the angel, and the angel told John. This is amazing that after 2,000 years, you and I are still fourth in line from God Almighty's message. How could there not be a blessing in here? Now, there are two ways that you can receive this blessing. And I find this totally fascinating. You can actually just sit there and open the book and read the text. 
You can just sit there and read the text. Let it enter the windows of your mind. Let the sunshine of God's Word simply shine into your soul. And there's a blessing there for you. But then, if you want the next blessing, you'll actually hear what the words are saying. You'll actually take them into your heart. And you'll be even more blessed because of the power that these words have to grab you. Now one of the first things we run into that, that might mess us up are phrases like soon take place or the time is near. Those tend to mess us up because we think an earthly time like lunch will soon take place. Or the time is near for football season. Amen. Okay, we think in earthly terms and we get excited about it. Now, I hate to get so deep in the first few verses, but have you ever been having a really, really good time? Okay, I don't know what you were doing, I don't know where you were, but you looked at your watch and you were like, okay, and you're having a really great time and you think what was about 15 minutes have gone by and you lose your watch again and it's been four hours. Have you ever had that happen? Have you ever done that? Man, you people need to get out and have a good time. <laughs> My word. One person. Well, here's the deal. Time flies when you're having fun. Time also flies when you're God. God is in the now all the time. Here's the deep part. God is eternal. Thus he operates outside of time. So when he says the time is near or the time is soon, it's from his perspective because the time is soon. He's here with immediacy in every second. And that's something that can blow our minds. But I just want us to focus on the blessings. Now, here's the reason I'm preaching this book. There are three basic reasons. I believe this book is no old that you can understand it and not fear it. I believe this book is hopeful. Even through the nastiest, darkest times, we are appointed to God who waits patiently to make things right. And third, I believe this book is final. The end is eventual and eternal. After the mess is cleaned up and the smoke clears, for those who love Jesus, the future is bright. <coughs> so there are blessings in store. Let's see some more. Verses 4 through 8. Verses 4 through 8. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. In this fascinating book, there is reviewing of the poor. Do I know and believe the gospel? I just, I just love the gospel message that we find compacted into this small section of verses. But first we need to deal with one of the symbols in this symbol-rich book. It's in verse 4. It's the number what? Seven. Now in the Bible, the number seven symbolizes completely, completeness. The number seven symbolizes completeness. How many days are in a week? Seven. How many times did Joshua march around Jericho before the walls fell. Seven. How many loaves fed the 4,000? How many baskets of loaves were picked up after the feeding of the 4,000? 
Seven. How many requests are in the Lord's Prayer? Seven. See, you know, seven. What day did I propose to my wife? <laughs> uh, seven. Okay? Completeness. And so when we read in the text that the sevenfold spirit is there. This is simply an illustration of the completeness of the Holy Spirit. So don't get too caught up, but we're going to see the number seven some more before we're done. But let's get to the good stuff, the gospel. Here is Jesus, the centerpiece, resurrected ruler. Look at verse 5b. Loves us and freed us from our what? From our sins. By his what? By his blood. And he made us to be what? A kingdom and priests. And he's coming, ready or not. Remember the first time he came? Remember the first time he came? No, because you weren't there. It's okay. There weren't many people that noticed. Okay? Just a few shepherds got called in from the pastor and his family was sitting there. There are no people that saw him the first time. Everybody's going to see him next time. Everybody is. <coughs> Mary cry cried. Okay? My hunch is that if Joseph was the kind of guy that he was, he probably cried too. Folks, the next time he comes, everybody's going to cry. It's the birth pangs of a whole new world that we're going to cry over. Everybody's going to see him and everybody's going to cry. Ready or not, here he comes. Here's the completeness of history, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. This is John's intro. But now let's actually dive into the actual vision. Verses 9 through 11. Verses 9 through 11. I, John, your brother and companion in suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the day of the Lord, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll which you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and Laodicea. In this fascinating book, there is hearing the roar, hearing the roar, perhaps the trumpet blast, or later the rushing water, we hear a roar. We find John in prison. It was like the Alcatraz of Rome, a four by six mile island in the Aegean Sea, Patmos, a hot and dusty mining island. But you know what? Even in prison, what was John doing on Sunday? He was worshiping. He was in the Lord. This is confirmation that you are in the right place at the right time to receive a vision from God today. You are in worship. But then a voice booms from behind. Let's see who it is. But first, do you feel like you're on Patmos right now? Do you feel like you're in some kind of prison? Do you feel like you need a word from God? Because may I suggest that you being in worship opens you up to hearing from Him. It may not be a booming voice. It may be a whisper. Nevertheless, this is where John was when he got this vision. It was on the Lord's day, on this day, doing what you're doing right now. Are you ready for a vision that God may be ready to give you. But let's see who's talking to him. Let's see who was behind the roar. Verses 12 through 16. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned to see, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like, this, like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest, his head and hair were white as wool, as white as snow. His eyes were bla like blazing fire. His feet were like 
bronze glowing in a furnace, and its voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held the seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all of its brilliance. In this fascinating book, there is a Jesus you've not seen before. What are the images of Jesus? What are the images of Jesus that you have? Just look at this Jesus. Look at the picture that it paints in your mind. This ain't a Hollywood Jesus. This isn't the Sunday school felt war Jesus. Not even the gospel Jesus that we like to imagine. This is one who is to come. This is one of the big reasons I believe that we need revelation because we're stuck in our good old gospel of Jesus, the suffering servant. Oh, we, we love him so much and we're stuck on that vision in his grubby robe with soft dark eyes with sandals. Kind of snuggly Jesus. We like that one. And that's how he came the first time. But when he comes again, he will come looking very differently. He will come as a conquering king. But friends, you don't need to worry if you know him and love him. You don't need to worry because it's still Jesus. Just read verses 17 through 20. Here we go. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and Hades. Right there for what you have heard. What is now and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand. And of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. In this fascinating book, there is time to hit the floor. Time to hit the floor. Are you secure in knowing Jesus? In this Jesus that we just met, needless to say, John was surprised. And Jesus knew it. But here's the great part. Here's the really great part. He's still Jesus. Don't you just love the second part of verse 17? Just look at the second part of verse 17. In fact, if you don't want to write that second part down, do not be afraid. Some of you just need to write that part down. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Some of you need to write that down on an encouragement card and stick it on your mirror. I know I'm going to need to until we get all the way through Revelation because there's some scary stuff in here. We need that encouragement. The one who loves us so much that he died for us is making everything right. If you know him now, you have nothing to fear. Nothing at all. Death and Hades, that is death and hell. He has the keys to. He's still in control. So John is to write in verse 19. He is to write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, now, what will take place later? You heard it echoed in the songs we sang and some of the texts. What was, what is, and what is to come. As we enter into this book, there will be an intense weaving of past, present, and future. Like no other book you've ever read. And so as past, present, and future swirl around us, it's easy to forget the one who this reality revolves around. And that's Jesus. In the end, friends, as we begin this series in Revelation, 
can I just be very honest with you? If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, this book is going to make no sense to you at the very minimum. If you do have a relationship with Jesus, I believe that this book can speak to you in powerful ways. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, this book is terrifying. But if you do have a relationship with Jesus, I believe this book is one of the most comforting books in all of the Bible. Can I ask you right now, who's the pilot of your personal plane? Your personal flight through life? Who's the pilot? Moreover, whose instructions are you following? I pray that today your pilot would be Jesus. And the instructions that you will follow, you will find in the book of Revelation. Let's pray together. Lord, I just thank you that you've given us this book. It's rather awesome, Lord, and I I try not to preach it, but I know it's a word that needs to be heard. So that we indeed can be ready. And Lord, there are some here today who know very well that they are not ready. Lord, I pray that if your spirit is moving inside them, if they've allowed you to speak to them today, Lord, that they would begin a relationship with you. It's so simple, but it's not easy. Simply to admit that we need you, that we can't do it on our own, that we're sinners, that we're broken. We need some new instructions. And so then we simply need to believe that you are who you said you are. And Lord, in Revelation, there are things that you say that are absolutely incredible. But we're going to believe who you said you are. One who was and is and is to come. Somebody may need to believe that even today. But then, Lord, if those that don't know you would commit themselves to following you and learning who you are, Lord, I pray that they would do it today, even in these moments that they can pray silently, quietly in their hearts. That they would come to know you and trust you as we journey together. Lord, for those who already know you and love you, I thank you that they have come along for the ride too. May they be encouraged. May they understand the urgency of the message that is here. We ask this all in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.